Welcome to the 2024-25 season of History Happy Hour here at the Boathouse Brew Pub. I'm your host, Jess Edberg, and I'm thrilled to be back hosting this monthly free program for another round of interesting, quirky, and sometimes humorous topics of Ely Air with a sized historical tale in about of information available through local resources or online resources and present them in an informal setting in the hopes of educating through entertaining and interesting stories to inspire you to dig deeper. Taking a moment to thank the supporters of this program include the Boathouse Brew Pub. So we are being hosted in this space free of charge. So please do take advantage of the service that's available. The Ely Folk School and Boundary Waters Connect to provide audio equipment. Dorothy Moulter Museum, which is my employer, to provide time for me to research these outreach programs. And the Ely Heritage Preservation Commission, which is a huge resource for area information. I'd also like to recognize the Donald G. Gardner Humanities Trust for a small grant that will turn last season's History Happy Hour programs into a podcast to hopefully increase awareness and accessibility of these history programs. Now, before I dive into our featured topic for this month, the Tanner Hospital, also known as Tanner's Hospital after Dr. Tanner, I'd like to make a sweeping generalization and assume all of us in this room value our shared Ely area history. We see it every day as we travel through our community. There is a literal treasure trove of historical stories, traditions, and structures. Now, if we break that down into history's many facets, the physical structures, you can see on this map that Ely city limits, we have 135 properties that have been inventoried by the Minnesota State Historic Preservation Office, also referred to as SHPO, including six listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Those nationally listed include two outside of town, Burntside Lodge and Sigurd Olson's Listing Point property, and the rest in city limit, which are the Ely Community Center, Ely's Historic State Theater, the Pioneer Mine Buildings and Head Frame, and of course, the guest of honor tonight, Tanner's Hospital. There are also structures that are considered eligible to be added to the National Register, but have either not been submitted or the paperwork has not been processed. Those include Ely City Hall and the Ely Post Office buildings. So what does it mean to be listed on the National Register? Well, the National Register is the nation's official list of buildings, structures, objects, sites, and districts that Americans believe are worthy of preservation. It was established in 1966 with the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act and is maintained by the National Park Service in partnership with federal, state, tribal, and local historic preservation offices. As of 2019, the National Register includes more than 95,000 listings comprising more than 1.8 million individual buildings, sites, structures, and objects, representing a wide sweep of American history. When listed on this National Register, preservation benefits and incentives are available such as eligibility for federal preservation tax credits and grant programs. The National Historic Preservation Act of 66 also provided for a network of historic preservation offices in each state to spearhead initiatives and help carry out the preservation program. Minnesota's SHPO was created by state statute in 1969 to provide statewide leadership in collaboration with other historical entities. For buildings in Ely, those entities might include St. Louis County Historical Society, the Ely Winton History Society, and the Ely Heritage Preservation Commission. But what makes the Tanner Hospital so incredible and special on either of these lists, other than the fact that it's really, really old? Well, for one, it still exists. In digging around old Ely Minor articles from the late 1800s and early 1900s, Nearly every single issue mentioned the word hospital at least once, usually many times. It wasn't too surprising for that era, to be honest, and it turns out there's something, some really interesting history on Ely hospitals, so I leaned into that. Ely's first hospital 
was in what is commonly known as the James Drug Building, which is now home to Potluck Kitchenware, Healthy Families Chiropractic, and Northeastern Minnesotans for Wilderness on the ground floor with a variety of other offices and businesses upstairs. The hospital, or rather infirmary, operated on the top floor with a druggist shop on the main level. Now, I've come across a few discrepancies in dates of when the drugstore slash infirmary opened, so I went with those from the Ely Historic Preservation Commission. Previously operating from the lobby of a hotel, possibly at that site, mining company doctor Charles Shipman had bigger plans and opened his drugstore slash hospital on August 28, 1888, the same year of City of Ely's incorporation. And until 1999 was the longest continuous running business in Ely at 111 years. Abijah James came to Ely from Pennsylvania in 1887. He made it by train to Tower, but walked the last 22 miles to the fledgling mining camp that became Ely the following year. During his trip, he became very ill, and upon his arrival in town, he lay down on a bench in the Exchange Hotel and passed out, the very hotel Dr. Shipman had been working out of. All day, people walked by and being used to seeing drunks lying about, did nothing. Finally, Dr. Shipman came to the hotel, noticed James, and examined him, soon discovering that he had typhoid fever. Shipman treated the fever and tended to James while he recovered, and their bromance took root. In their conversations, Dr. Shipman learned that James and offered him a business partnership, convincing James to stay in Ely because, let's be honest, what fledgling boomtown doesn't need drugs and doctors? My favorite bromance anecdote is how Shipman attempted to help his naturally thin friend bulk up by recommending he try beer to facilitate weight gain. James bought a case of beer and after a month went back to Shipman and told him that the beer wasn't working. Shipman asked him, and asked him how much he had drank, and James very earnestly said he took a tablespoon every day, endearingly following his own directions for the tonics he likely sold and completely missing out on not only the weight gain effects, but also the mood-altering side effects that bring many people joy. As it turns out, the demand for medical services increased significantly, and expansion was required for Shipman to continue offering care for the growing town of Ely. So Shipman began work on a new, larger hospital, and James bought out Dr. Shipman's interest in the drugstore. The Shipman Hospital opened for patients by 1895 and was a three-story wood Victorian building considered modern for its time. It was designed in Madison, Wisconsin by Dr. Shipman's father, a renowned architect who had also designed the Capitol building for the state of Wisconsin, and apparently that made it fancy. It was affiliated with the small emergency hospital in Winton and was this located where the library is today on Chapman Street. It served the people of Ely as its main facility until 1958 when Ely Blumenson Hospital was built and opened. It makes sense that in a booming mine town, Ely would continue to grow very quickly. Sadly, this also meant that a larger population concentrated not only in a small community, but also crammed in the mines would require additional medical practitioners with the space and means to address the disease outbreaks common at that time, as well as the catastrophic, catastrophic injuries, along with the normal dangers daily life at the end of the 19th century presented. I mean, doctors had just started using soap in the 1840s. Additionally, this active disease environment stemmed from poor water and sewage systems common on the Iron Range which were not heavily invested in because of the fear that the mines petering out would result in the loss of their capital investment. Enter Dr. Entero Tanner, considered by many to be a radical Finnish socialist, and he was. Tanner was born in Finland in 1868 during the period of Finland existing as a grand duchy under the Russian Empire, essentially meaning Finland self-governed but was ultimately ruled over by Russia. However, this changed with Russia's February Manifesto in 1889, creating the policy of Russification of Finland aimed at eliminating the Grand Duchy and possibly the termination of its political autonomy and cultural uniqueness. To really lean into this dystopian angle in Finland, 
the Lutheran state church and its cohort of other Protestant denominations imposed social and economic pressures on society by imposing religious requirements for legal marriage, travel outside the country, and work professions. This all set the stage for rebellion and the rise of socialism. Tanner became very passionate in socialism and the right of the people to freely think during his time at Helsinki University and became quite outspoken, putting a target on his back and prompting him to leave Finland and sail to America in 1889. Tanner arrived in Rockport, Massachusetts, and very quickly was accused of being a socialist. At this time, being branded a socialist was more an endorsement of new ideas, workers' rights, and community responsibility, very commonly embraced by immigrants and often criticized by religious leaders and industrial magnates. In the summer of 1899, Tanner helped form the Socialist Democratic Mirsky Society, the first Finnish socialism society in the world and a precursor to the Socialist Society of America, which started in 1901. Always concerned with the position of women in society, he also helped bring about the Jiri Society, the first women's socialist group. Their common belief was that societal conditions for the working man needed improvement. Tanner's fervent desire to inform his fellow Finn immigrants led him to start the American Tayomis, or the American Worker Paper, in January 1900 in order to, quote, shout into everyone's ears that there is much in this world that is not as it should be. By July, Tanner began a Midwest tour seeking subscriptions for his publication, but being met with the opposition as most of the communities he's visited were built upon the industries that had thrived on immigrant workers doing what they were told in order to get paid no matter the risk. In some communities, police were ordered to arrest any socialist organizers, and it was often difficult for Tanner to find places to eat, sleep, and speak. He decided to move his paper to Minneapolis, and after barely settling in, found out his partners back east decided to end the publication. Sad and weary, he submitted articles to other papers and held talks with small groups and casually passed the time by getting his medical license from the University of Minnesota. At some point, it appears Tanner's wife, Venny Tanner, was a guest soloist at the Ely Opera, where Dr. Tanner was then invited to speak about the chemical and physical wonders of the world. In short order, he moved his family to Ely in 1902, purchased two lots in 1903, and began building his hospital that year. Tanner's new hospital was modern, with a complete lab, surgery, and dispensary, and focused not only on the physical needs of the patient, but provided for the mental needs as well. It was designed for convenience, light, and ventilation, with steam heat, electric power, and hot water accommodating up to 20 patients at one time. It offered a window-filled turret, which could cover from surgery, enjoying the room's therapeutic view of Shago Lake and the five iron ore mines nearby. Tanner appeared to have a holistic approach to healing and wellness at his hospital, and that aligned with his progressive socialist views, but likely labeled him as such, which wasn't necessarily a good thing in a mining town. Tanner fell into a category of early entrepreneurship called entrepreneurial social medicine, which is now defined as utilizing effective business practices combined with social and cultural awareness to change the lives of those in need. This type of business venture had been around for a while, but began to be heavily studied in the 1980s. This is the second reason that this hospital was deemed appropriate for state and national registry. It was constructed as an entrepreneurial response to the resulting need to care for the sick. In his age before social acceptance of this responsibility, or <clears throat> socialism, and served this function until the 1930s. The very thing that essentially exiled him from Finland is why this hospital was nominated for the State and National Historic Registry. Tanner didn't just stop with the hospital. He saw another need for the community, a Finnish newspaper. Initially wanting to buy the Northerner, which seemed to be dying, he went on to publish the Ateta, or Ideals, it catered to the working man, but only lasted three months. Again, Ely was a mining town with plentiful jobs at a time where jobs were hard to come by elsewhere in the country. 
Folks were hesitant to openly support anything preaching a socialist or labor viewpoint. Shops were hesitant to sell it. And most folks who would want to jump on the bandwagon were too poor to subscribe to it. He did, however, help establish the Amatra Society in Ely, a working men and women's benevolent association founded in 1890 by Finnish immigrants in Brooklyn, New York's Fintown. It was dedicated to fraternal and educational needs. It appears it was also common to have a dramatics group in the Amatra Society as part of the club, and the Ely crew performed often at the Temperance Hall. In fact, Tanner had a lot of interests and hobbies. In the short time he operated the hospital, he also built a boat in the basement for use at his summer home on Shagla Lake. Miscalculating the dimensions of both the boat and the door opening, he had to tear out part of the outside wall to remove it. When the political situation died down in Finland, he moved back for a while, but ended up returning to the United States and ended up living and practicing medicine in Chisholm, while championing marriage, birth control, and sexuality. He died in Chisholm on November 20th, 1920, before his plans to build a new, even more modern hospital could come to fruition. Before returning to Finland, Tanner had sold his hospital to Dr. Carol Carpenter in 1907. A new doctor and surgeon to town, Carpenter moved up from Minneapolis, and the building began to be referred to as Carpenter's Hospital. Unfortunately, during Carpenter's admission, the hospital slowly fell into debt, and with low numbers of patients, he made a decision to sell it to a real estate company. The roughly 30-year run of this medical facility had ended, and the building was rebranded and refaced to become the new Lakeview Apartments from the late 1950s to around the 1980s. The building has changed hands since then, with rooms of worry, apartments or office spaces being built in. However, the gutting of the interior is about as far as anybody seems to have gotten. In 2015, the hospital was purchased by Ali A Realty with the goal of renovating the building and bringing it back to its historical splendor and productivity. It appears testing the soil and foundation in 2018 is the last process that's been conducted on site. It's unknown what, if any, remediation is required to continue restoration of this very old structure. The future of this historic structure may not be as easy to find as its interesting history, but what I do know is there's some weird stuff that's happened in and around this building for decades. If you attended the very first History Happy Hour last November, you may recall that this very room we're sitting in was once used by an undertaker and as a morgue. Its proximity to the Tanner Hospital made it a convenient location and we know that there were many, many people that died between Ely's incorporation in 1888 and the 1920s. In my search for paranormal stories about the hospital, many of the common themes popped up among, from folks. Shadow figures, silhouettes and windows, strange lights, and otherworldly sounds. These are not surprising, at least to me. They're kind of par for the haunted course, if you will. Ghost hunters are forming at the mouth to gain access and investigate inside due to the loaded history and sheer volume of stories, including this guy Bones, who has a YouTube channel with videos ranging from spooky abandoned buildings to raising a Doberman puppy. So you can choose which YouTuber you prefer to get your scary stories from. But there are two stories that stand out, and these are stories that I was told by the person who experienced them. The first story was told to me by a former resident of the Lakeview Apartments. She and her mother lived there for several years in the 1970s. In addition to objects being moved or missing for a bit, she recalled one specific time when she had a very heated argument with her mother, the kind where other residents no doubt heard them yelling at each other. They both ended up leaving the apartment upset, and when they returned, the inside of their apartment door had all of their kitchen knives sticking out of it, as if someone had been practicing their knife-throwing skills with a very sharp knife. The scary part was neither of them had been back in the apartment and nobody else had a key. The storyteller implied that there were many other things that had happened that just didn't seem right, but that this was the most unsettling. The second story was from one of the former owners of the hospital. He had plans to gut and renovate it, but eventually sold it. While gutting the interior, his Rook, rook crew was himself, 
his friend, and his own dog. However, the dog refused to enter the building. Now, I don't know about you, but when a dog refuses to enter a building, I'm going to trust their judgment, especially in this scenario. Spooky things that you would expect began to occur, such as strange noises, but it didn't deter their work at first. One day, the buddy had been working upstairs and had to go downstairs and out the door for something in his vehicle. As he approached the edge of the staircase, he felt two hands land on his back and forcefully shove him down the staircase. Thankfully, he only sustained bruises, but it absolutely changed his perspective on working at that site. Now, I don't know about you, but the history of this building was incredibly interesting to me, and the community focus of Dr. Tanner really resonated, and now I will always look at that building in a new light. Now, I would also like to thank all of you for being here and provide acknowledgement for my sources for photos that were used in this presentation, as well as information resources. And again, thank our supporters, the Boathouse Brew Pub for allowing us to host this here, Ely Folk School, Boundary Waters Connect, Ely Heritage Preservation Commission, and the Dorothy Moulter Museum. Now, this program is offered on the third Wednesday of the month through May. And a sneak peek into next month and the month after programs, we have the Sedan Mine for November, also known as the Cadillac of Mines. And in December, a special holiday focus on Krampus. Krampus in Ely? Yes, that is right. Krampus is found in the folklore from Austria, Bavaria, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, Northern Italy, Slovakia, and Slovenia. So tune in next month on November 20th, and I hope to see you all here again. Thank you for attending.